Well, my name's John. I'm one of the pastors here at Stillwater, and I'm so thankful that you've joined us online this weekend to worship Jesus. It is just so good uh, to be with you wherever you're experiencing this from uh, this weekend. So we're continuing our message series, which is called Rebuild. And it's a series based on the book of Nehemiah. You might remember last week that Nehemiah is just a normal guy. He's a normal guy who is a servant uh, of the king of Persia, and he has a special access to the king. Uh, Nehemiah is the cupbearer for the king. And if you remember, we backed up a little bit in Israelite history to find that the Israelites, this is about 450 years before, the, uh, before Jesus is born, the Israelites have been hauled away uh, into captivity by the Babylonians because they disobeyed God over and over and over and over. So they were pulled out of the, the land that was God's covenant promise to them, and they were placed in Babylonian captivity. Eventually, it would become Persian captivity as the Persians would overtake the Babylonians. And the Persians had a different philosophy. They were willing to send some of the captives back home to begin to rebuild these areas where they had been taken from. So the Israelites had begun this, but it wasn't going so well. In fact, it was going terribly. Uh, the temple had been rebuilt, but the walls were still in ruins, so the city had no defense. Uh, it, was, it was not a good situation. And Nehemiah had a burden on his heart. And you know, God gives us burdens as well. Nehemiah had a burden for the broken down walls of Jerusalem. What's your burden? Because I know God's given you something. I've been around this church long enough to see how God uses these things. God gives different burdens to different ones of us. And then we take and we respond to those things. And God uses it in such amazing ways. Our ministries here at Stillwater, virtually every single one of them is the result of a burden that God laid on somebody's heart. Oftentimes somebody, a layperson within our congregation. And it is just awesome to see how God takes those burdens and uses them for his glory. So Nehemiah has this burden to see the, the walls of Jerusalem rebuilt. And in Jerusalem, it was a mess, but he asked, he's going to ask the king tonight to go back there. But remember, this is not where he started. He didn't start with action. No, before Nehemiah acted, you remember from last week, he first he sat down and wept over the brokenness. Then he knelt down to pray and to ask God to be with him and to lead and guide him. And, and then, and only then, did he stand up to act. So this week we're going to get real practical. And we're going to look at how is it that we can take steps forward in our spiritual lives. How can we take steps forward when we feel God giving us a nudge in our life today? How do we do this work? Well, the first thing we do is we seek God faithfully. Now, this kind of ties into last week. We seek God faithfully. We're called to do this because it's not just, Nehemiah doesn't just pray at the very beginning. No, he prays throughout the entire book of Nehemiah, throughout the entire story. He's praying. And so Nehemiah seeks God for like four months, okay? So he has this broken heart, but he doesn't do anything for four months. Some time has passed. And so now, one day, he's going to have the opportunity to act. Check it out. Nehemiah chapter 2, verse 1. Early the following spring in the month of Nisan. Okay, remember, this is four months after the original, the original vision that he had, the original burden that he had. So you had Nisan, you had Toyota, you had Honda. Now we're in the month of Mazda, right? I don't know why the Israelites named their months after Japanese cars, but it seems logical, right? I mean, trust me, I know these things. My Old Testament classes from seminary, they're still up here. I'm sure of that. Regardless, so here we are in the month of Nisan, during the 20th year of King Artaxerxes' reign, I was serving the king his wine. Remember, that was Nehemiah's job. He would taste the wine and the food, then he would give them to the king. And this was a safety precaution to make sure that the king wasn't being poisoned by any of his enemies. I had never appeared sad in his presence. Now that seems odd, doesn't it? Surely he's had a bad day. Surely the king has said something that irritated him or made him feel sad. Surely he got sad at the prospect that maybe somebody's poisoning the king and this might be the last food he ever eats. But he's never shown sadness. Why? Well, because it was actually against the law to be sad in the presence of a Persian king. 
These guys like news, but only good news. They don't want to hear the bad stuff. They only want to hear the good stuff. And so this is Nehemiah and the king's relationship. He's never sad there. But this day he is, and the king notices it. Verse 2, so the king asked me, why are you looking so sad? You don't look sick to me. You must be deeply troubled. Then I was terrified, busted. But I replied, long live the king. How can I not be sad? For the city that my, where my ancestors are buried is in ruins, and the gates have been destroyed by fire. Then the king said, well, how can I help you? With a prayer to the God of heaven. Now notice that. He takes a time out. We'll take a time out here because he prays once again. Now he's been doing some serious prayer over the past four months. We know that. But this is not a big long prayer. This is a short like text kind of prayer, right? This is like a 911, God help me now. And God answers both kinds of prayers. In fact, you and I need both of them in our lives. Our prayer life should include both longer prayers because we need that time of intimacy and closeness with God, listening to God, sitting with God, it, whether it's meditating on his word, whether it's prayer, whether it's song, whether it's worship, whatever it is, we need to do that. But sometimes we also just need to shout out a quick prayer to God. God, help. I need you. I need you. And God answers that prayer as well. There's nothing, nothing that is too small for the heart of God. If you feel like you should pray about it, do it. There's nothing that's too small for the heart of God. And maybe you say, well, you know, I can accomplish what I'm called to do. I can accomplish my vision, my dreams, my plans without praying about them. If that's the case, let me tell you, your vision is too small. If your vision can be accomplished without prayer, then your vision is too small. So the first thing that we do is we seek God faithfully in prayer. And once we've done so, whether long prayers or short prayers, some of both, then and only then uh, do we get to step number two, which is we define the vision clearly, okay? We need to be able to understand what God is calling us to do and to define it with, with clarity. And, and that's so important. Look at what Nehemiah does in verse five. He says, if it pleases the king and if you are pleased with me, your servant, send me to Judah to rebuild the city where my ancestors are buried. One sentence, really clear. You know, the king asked him that, and he's like, well, geez, I just, I'm so sad. I don't know what I could possibly do. It, the, the king probably wouldn't have responded well to that. But here he's got one sentence. It's really clear. It's actionable. It's tangible. If you, if you do vision statements at work, you know this is a solid vision statement right here. If, if, it ple if you're pleased with me, send me to Judah to rebuild the city where my ancestors are buried. You know, clarity of vision is, is sometimes challenging, especially this year. It's really hard to have clear vision this year because so many things are messed up. I mean, we came into this year, right, with, with, like, with slogans and all these kind of things, right? You probably heard the phrase, like, 2020 vision, right? And we thought we're coming in with all this new, new decade and new clarity, and our 2020 vision ended up just being, like, two black eyes and a kick to the crotch, right? You know, it's been one of those kind of years. And maybe you're like, this was not what I was envisioning, and I... I don't even know, I don't even know what God's vision is for me. Does God still have vision for my life? What is this? Well, maybe God's vision will look different for you than what it has in the past. Maybe God's calling will look different. I mean, we, we just showed you an example, right? VBX. This is something that's really important in our children's ministry, and we've had this for a long time at Stillwater Church, and it's something that's really central, and when we realize that we might not be able to safely have kids in person, because it's kind of hard to keep them distant, you know, and we didn't know if we'd be able to do that yet, we decided to do a virtual option, and, and look at how God blessed it. Yeah, it was different, but God blessed it, God used it, and a whole bunch of kids got to hear the good news of Jesus and participate there as family groups. My prayer is that God drew families closer to each other. 
I mean, VBX is often something that's kind of like free babysitting, right? You drop them off and you go get dinner. Like, well, that's, that's what Jennifer and I always did, I guess, for our kids were younger, full disclosure. But, you know, uh, you got to do it differently this year. And, and God is still working. God is working in ways that may even surprise us. Uh, there's, there's so many things. Our, our food pantry, such an important ministry for us. And, and yeah, it may look a little different this year, uh, but it's so essential. And it's, it's awesome to see how you all continue to support the food pantry. I and mean, you've got folks that, that aren't going to the grocery store, but they're, they're doing their Kroger click list, and they're, they're having it delivered to the church. And that's pretty amazing to me. I mean, I just see the Kroger delivery guys coming in, uh, bringing the food in that, that you all are giving. Or somebody, the other day, somebody brought in 600 bucks worth of spaghetti. Do you know how many people get fed by 600 bucks worth of spaghetti? Neither do I, but I think it's a lot, right? And they said, you know what? The, there was just, I had extra money through the, the funding that, that came in through the government, and I just felt led to, to give this. That's awesome. That's awesome. It's, it's a weird year, yeah, but there's ways that God is still moving, and God is still nudging. Listen to those nudges. Listen to those things. Maybe, uh, you, you know, we're coming upon that, that time of the year where, where we build a house together, right? It's one of our favorite things of the year. And we just, this past week, our folks met and just decided with all the different things and, and challenges with the places we send houses and all that, that we're going to have to postpone that a year. And man, that makes my heart sad. And I know for many, many of us that we love that. We look forward to it every September. But listen, that doesn't mean that God's vision is shutting down. It doesn't mean that God doesn't care about helping with housing. Maybe, uh, maybe God's going to open up your eyes to see a single mom in the neighborhood or a, or a senior citizen who you could go and help them with some house stuff. I mean, you're probably not going to frame a house for them on your own. Maybe. I don't know. But more likely, you might help them with a project or rake their leaves this fall or whatever it is. Take that same passion that God has put upon you and, and ask God, God, how do you want me to do this? How do you want me to do this? I know one guy in our congregation, he's literally spent months clearing, clearing um, fallen trees from tornado damage for one family that just had massive, massive damage. And he just, he said, you know, this is my way of making it through the shutdown time of this pandemic, is that it's me and the chainsaw and Jesus out here. And I think that's awesome. Just because our, our country has shut down in various ways doesn't mean that God's vision is shut down. Doesn't mean that God's calling has slowed down whatsoever. So, and, and you know, we do the same thing in our, in our growth spiritually as well. Uh, just like we talked about earlier in the service, we've got a great uh, spiritual, uh, spiritual gifts class that's coming up soon and uh, with, with Pastor Jordan and Pastor Matt. And it's just going to be an awesome time to get to know your spiritual gifts. So we talked about that last series and, and to grow in these more and more. And it's going to happen here in person and virtually at the same time. So whether you're comfortable coming here or not, doesn't matter. Uh, you can participate in this class and God can use that uh, to help you grow. Maybe your community group is meeting online, or maybe you've been one, part of a group that hasn't. Let's get it going, because, uh, you know, we're going to probably be here for a while. So let's, let's uh, find ways to gather together and to encourage each other, to help each other to grow in Jesus Christ. So we seek God faithfully. We define vision clearly. We define these next steps clearly. And that makes, for number three, we make plans carefully. We make plans carefully. Because I don't know about you, but I have a lot of like goals in my life. I have a lot of things that I want to accomplish. And, and some of these I get done and others I don't. And there's a key differentiator between those two. The ones that I get done by and large are the ones that I make a plan to get done. I plan carefully. I put it on my calendar, or I set aside funds, or I set aside time, or I, or I set up meetings, whatever it is. These things that I plan tend to happen. And this other category of like goals that I have that I don't make plans for, eh, they tend not to happen. Because you know how it goes. Say, oh, I'll get to that soon, right? And if you don't make plans, careful plans, it just doesn't happen. A goal without a plan is just a wish, okay? And wishes are nice, but they don't get us very far. So we've got to make plans. If God is nudging you, if God is laying this on your heart, make a plan. Look at what Nehemiah did, verse 6. The king, with the queen sitting beside him, asked, how long will you be gone? When will you return? After I told him how long I'd be gone, the king agreed to my request. So he had a plan. 
He's taking on this massive project. He doesn't even know how long it's going to take, and yet he's got a plan for how long he's asking the king to let him go for. I mean, I bet that if, he asked the king, if the king asked him that question, and Nehemiah said, oh, I, phew, I have no idea. I mean, maybe months, years, I don't know. We'll see. I mean, you guys see how it goes, king, right? I'm going to bet that the answer would have been a lot different. I'm going to bet we wouldn't be talking about Nehemiah today, in fact, because Nehemiah had a clear plan for, for what he was asking the king. Verse 7, I also asked the king, if it please the king, let me have letters addressed to the governors of the providence west of the Euphrates River, instructing them to let me travel safely through their territories on my way to Judah. Remember, he's the king over all these areas. So basically, king, would you tell those people whose, whose areas I'm going to be traveling through, would you tell them to let me travel safely? Verse 8, and please give me a letter addressed to Asaph, the manager of the king's forest, instructing him to give me timber. I will need it to make beams for the gates, uh, for, uh, for the gates of the city. And you know, the thing is that last week I told you that Nehemiah was a man of action. He was a man of great administration. And you see here how he does that. Uh, Nehemiah has plans. They're specific. He's asking for provision. He's asking for protection. He's asking all of this for all of these kinds of things. So, so he's got plans, and, and he knows exactly what he's called to do. He, he's, he knows exactly what he's called to do. Finally, and the king granted these requests because the gracious hand of God was upon me. Not by Nehemiah's strength, not just his vision, his idea, but God's hand was upon him. And, and you might be saying, well, I don't have like a perfect plan. I don't know how to make a, a perfect plan. What, how do I possibly do this? Well, first, there are no perfect plans, okay? Plans often have to be revised and modified or whatnot. Don't get stuck in like analysis paralysis where you, you don't plan because you don't know all the exact right answers, Sometimes we got to put some plans in place and we got to kind of set those things in jello, knowing that they're going to change a little bit along the way. That's okay. That's okay. But, but beyond that, we, we, we commit these plans to the Lord, but also maybe we need to get help from others in our lives. We need to ask folks in our community group or in your family or other trusted loved ones and say, I'm struggling. I, this is the goal. This is the thing that I think God's laying on my heart but I'm struggling to understand what the plan would be, how I would get there. Ask God what that might be and, and ask your friends as well. Maybe, maybe God will speak through them even. You, you don't have to have the perfect plan, but you do have to take the next step. You, you know the old phrase, how do you eat an elephant? One bite at a time, right? Which is a weird phrase, right? I mean, who eats elephants? I, I I don't know. That seems odd to me. I don't know if somebody was like at the fair and they had an elephant ear and they're like, this is amazing. I should eat the whole thing one bite at a time. I don't know how they came up with that, but it seems kind of odd. Regardless, you got to take steps. If you're going to do something big, you got to take steps. You've got to do that. God calls us to do that step by step. This is exactly what Nehemiah did. So verse 11, he makes the journey. So I arrived in Jerusalem. Three days later, I slipped out during the night, taking only a few others with me. I had not told anybody about the plans that God put on my heart for Jerusalem. We took no pack animals with us except the donkey I was riding. Now, this is interesting. Nehemiah has been there just a few days. He's just kind of gotten settled in. He's made some connections with people around him. Remember, his brother was there. And then he decides to go out and to survey these walls that are broken down. Now, if you'll remember back, these walls were the thing that Nehemiah had, had wept over. When his brother came back and he said, it's not going well. The walls lie in ruins. The gates, they've been burned. It's a city that's got a temple being rebuilt, but there's no defense. There's no safety. And when Nehemiah heard this, he sat down and wept. And so you've got to understand that, if, that for Nehemiah, this was a deeply emotional thing. This wasn't just a building project. This wasn't just stones and sticks and trash and mess. He wasn't just looking at it and just saying, oh, wow, what a project. We've got a lot on our hands here, don't we? No, this was deeply personal to him. 
Because as, as an Israelite man, this Jerusalem was the holy city. The place where they believed that God dwelt, right? God had promised he would dwell there at the temple where people, where Jews from all over would come and worship God here at this place. And when he sees the city that can't even defend itself, that doesn't even have the, the basics of walls, he's heartbroken. I wonder if that's why he went out by himself. I mean, I don't know why. It doesn't tell us why. I wondered if he needed to go out and just have another good cry out there. I'm not sure. But we know that this was a, a difficult thing to do, to, to go out into the rubble and to tour it and to see what all was going on there. But you know, sometimes we need to do just that. Sometimes we need to go, maybe it's just us and Jesus, and we need to kind of walk through the rubble that's in our lives. Maybe it's some broken relationships or broken dreams. Maybe it's some hurts that nobody else even knows about. Wrongs that we've done or wrongs that have been done to us. Whatever it is, maybe we need to tour that rubble a little. And I know it's hard. We'd often rather like stuff it down, pretend that it doesn't exist, try to avoid dealing with it. Maybe for some of us, we need to go through some of that rubble with the help of a counselor. We need to talk with others who can really help us to, to guide us through that. Because the thing is that Jesus is the great physician, and he loves you, and he cares about you, and he wants to help you in the midst of that rubble. He wants to, to wipe away those tears. He wants to help heal the, that pain. He wants to support you in ways that nobody else on this earth can. Are you willing to do this? Maybe, it's, maybe, we, need, maybe we need to get out of some denial here. Maybe we've been pretending that there's not any rubble. But we've got to look at the facts of this stuff. I mean, if you're going to rebuild facts, they're your best friends. They may not always be pretty, but you need to look at them. You need to understand them. And you need to experience God's healing so that you've got some solid foundation on which this rebuild can happen. I wonder, maybe for some of us, we may have some broken down walls in our spiritual lives. You know, the Jerusalem was the place where people would go to connect with God. Maybe if we look at our own spiritual life, we say, you know, the walls aren't as strong as they once were. I've kind of neglected some spiritual disciplines in my life, or I've kind of just neglected my spiritual life as a whole. Listen to what Proverbs says, chapter 25, verse 28. It says, whoever has no rule over his own spirit is like a city broken down without walls. <laughs> How interesting. A city broken down without walls. In other words, Jerusalem. Maybe where Nehemiah walked that night is a bit of an image of where we are as well. Maybe we aren't as far off from this book as you once thought you are. Whoever has no rule over his own spirit is like a city broken down without walls. And, and here's the thing. God wants to rebuild these walls. He does. He does. And maybe you've been kicking yourself. Maybe you've been feeling so guilty. You've just been beating up on yourself because you're not doing it right. Listen, you're not doing this on your own strength. God is the master builder. Not me and not you. Thanks be to God. He wants to rebuild these walls. He wants to rebuild these things in our lives. He wants to help. So maybe you say, okay, great, that's awesome, but also a little vague. How on earth does that happen? Give me some practical help here. Well, I want to talk about something that's called a, a rule of life. And um, a rule of life, maybe it's a, a new concept to you. Um, this is something that uh, Pastor Jordan and myself and others here have gone to seminary that we've done even as class projects in school. That's how much seminaries value it. And let me tell you why they value it. Because a rule of life is, is pretty straightforward. It's, it's a simple plan as to how are you going to live, to live intentionally instead of just letting life happen to you. 
And says, so oh, I'm just a, I'm a victim of all of these bad circumstances. No, I'm going to take control. I'm going to take some ownership for my own life. And by the power of God, I'm going to live differently. I'm going to live with some intentionality. And a rule of life can cover all sorts of different areas, but I want to focus on four this weekend. Uh, and these come, um, they're not original to me, they come from a guy named Pete Scazzaro, wrote great, a couple of great books, um, one of which is called Emotionally Healthy uh, Spiritual Life, uh, other Emotionally Healthy Leadership, similar book, we're going through that as a staff now actually. And he talks about four areas, prayer, rest, relationships, and work. Prayer, rest, relationships, and work. And I challenge you to take some time this week and focus on those areas. In fact, take some time today. Or if not today, don't go to bed tonight without putting it on your calendar. Because if you don't, remember, <laughs> plan without, without practical steps here, is, it's just a wish, okay? We've gotta have plans here. We've gotta have plans, not just wishes. Prayer, rest, relationships, and work. What if you would look at each of those four areas and ask God how God wants to move in your heart? Where is God calling you to grow in each of these? Prayer. Maybe you look and you say, honestly, I don't really pray. Okay? Well, don't beat yourself up about it. It's, it, it's a perfect day to start. Set aside some time. Set aside three minutes or five minutes each day. Maybe it's first thing when you get up or last thing when you go to bed or maybe it's over your lunch break or maybe it's some other time, but some time where you can just spend some time focusing on God. God, here I am. I want to praise you for how good you are. I want to ask you to work in these areas. I want to confess my sins to you. I want to listen to you. Is there any way that you're guiding me today? Help me to hear you. It doesn't have to be fancy or big words. Just, God, here I am. Would you speak? Prayer. How can you do that specifically? You set aside a, specific, a time for that. Second, rest. We all need it. I mean, after all, God created six days and he rested one, so that means you and I need to do that as well. Um, many of you have heard me talk about how this was an area I was struggling in my life. It was the Sabbath keeping. And, and a couple of years ago, I felt really convicted about it. And, and I had to make a plan for how I was going to do that. And that was the thing that changed it for me. It wasn't guilt. I already knew that I was sinning. I already knew that I was wrong. It wasn't uh, just hope or desire. It was a plan. It took a plan. So how are you doing with rest? It's something that we need to do. Are you setting aside that Sabbath day each week? Or is there some other way that God is calling you to take time to rest? Uh, third, relationships. Look at your relationships with other people. Is there somebody that you need to be investing in that you're not? Or maybe you need to seek out a mentor in your life, and God's been laying somebody on your heart to ask you, but you haven't had the courage to do it. Maybe there's a relationship that's broken, and you need to ask for forgiveness, or you need to, to have a difficult conversation. Uh, maybe, I don't know what it is for you, but, but, but how is it that God's calling you to, to, uh, to grow in your relationships? And, and, and it may not even be something that I list off but I bet God's going to lay it on your heart as you work on this rule of life. Um, so, so we have prayer, uh, we have rest, we have relationships, and finally work. And, and you don't have to have a vocational job that you get paid for. God calls all of us to work. It's, it's a healthy and important thing to do. But maybe you look at your job if you have one, or maybe you look at how you approach school. Students are going to be firing that back up soon, soon again. Uh, how is God calling you to live as a student this year? Uh, or maybe you look at um, how you can volunteer or whatever it may be. The Bible says whatever we do, we should do it with our whole heart, working for the Lord, not for people. So how can you live that out more fully in your life? Prayer, rest, relationship, and work. If we invest in these things, these are ways that God will build up, will strengthen those spiritual walls, those spiritual structures in our life, those protections that we need, those strongholds that we need, they're good strongholds in our lives that, that, that help keep us close to the Lord. God wants to bring up, to, to build up those things in our lives. Maybe you just pick one thing in each of these areas. 
Don't feel like you got to list off 16 different things because if your plans are too big, we oftentimes just get discouraged and don't do them. Pick some practical things. This is what Nehemiah did uh, as in his life and, and, and as he made specific plans for how he was going to do this. And then he takes action. Verse 17. But now I said to them, to the Israelites, you know very well what trouble we're in. Jerusalem lies in ruins, and its gates have been destroyed by fire. Let us rebuild the wall of Jerusalem and end this disgrace. Then I told them about how the gracious hand of God had been upon me and about my conversation with the king. Then they replied at once, yes, let us rebuild the wall. So they began the good work. So now he springs into action. He inspires others around him. He is ready. He has wept. He has prayed. He has sought the Lord. He has made plans. And now he's ready for action. Now he's ready to lead others. This is how we do it. This is how we do it. We seek God faithfully. We define the vision carefully and then, or clearly. Then we make plans carefully. And when we do this, God works in and through us. So I challenge you this week to take some time to, uh, to put together a little bit of detail on that rule of life and then to live that out. God wants to bless your life through this. Would you pray with me? God, I just pray that you would be working in our hearts, in our minds, in our lives. God, that you would be rebuilding that which has been broken down, that which the enemy has sought to destroy. God, I just pray that you would be bringing your resurrection power that changes lives, that changes hearts, that helps us to be restored into the people that you are calling us to be. God, we give ourselves to you this day. We give you these rules of life, God, and we ask that you would be working in our hearts, that you'd even be guiding us. Holy Spirit, I pray that you would fill our minds and fill our hearts as we seek you. I pray that you would meet us as we set out to do this and that you would just use these things to build up spiritual strength in our lives, that you would strengthen us, mind, body, and spirit as we do this. Lord, we love you and we pray this in Jesus' holy name. Amen.